בוקר טוב לכולם, אני אדבר באנגלית בגלל שיש לנו מישהו מבחינת. אני נמצא מהמשרד של תמיר, מהמשרד של ה-CS, פה באופן יו. ובוקר טוב לישראל ה-CS תיאורי פה באוניברסיטה. אנחנו נתחיל קצת 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 Israel has a strong community in the theory of CS, and Israeli researchers appear regularly in the leading conferences in the theory of CS. We thought that it would be a good idea to hold annual meetings on theory of CS in Israel. Uh, this thought led to the first uh, CS theory day that took place here uh, two years ago. It was a very interesting and enjoyable day, thanks to the invited speakers, six from Israel and two from abroad. And the audience that attended that day, which composed of uh, undergraduate and graduate students, uh, CS graduates and faculty from all over the country. The second day took place here last year. It was also a great success. Uh, uh, since the first day was very, very intense with eight lectures, and uh, we reduced in the second day the number of lectures to uh, six. Uh, six uh, three sessions, uh, six lectures of 50 minutes each. Uh, five speakers from Israel and one from um, abroad and it seems that that format is uh, was a good format and we stick to that format also um, uh, this year uh, I would like to thank the speakers that will give a talk here today so the speakers are uh, Ruth Zwick from Tel Aviv University uh, Shafi Goldwasser from uh, Weizmann Institute uh, Amos Beimel from Ben Gurion University Zev Nutov from here from the Open University Gil Kalai from the Hebrew University and uh, probably jet-legged uh, Piotr Indik mm -hmm. that came from MIT to join us. Uh, this is the first day that we dared to add an ordinal number to the title of the day, the third uh, mm -hmm. Israel CST every day. Uh, the usage of such an ordinal number uh, conveys a hope that uh, there will be also a fourth and a fifth and that will, this is the beginning of a long-lasting uh, tradition. At this point, I would like to invite uh, Professor Chagit Masaryon, the president of the Open University, to say a few words. Boker tov lekulam, toda rava. I want to start by apologizing to our guest, Professor Indik, for speaking in Hebrew. And uh, uh, Noga promised to translate to him, but there is a good reason, and you will see about it in, in a short while. Um, אז אני רוצה להתחיל באמת מלהודות לתמיר, מתוך השלוש פעמים שהכנס הזה מתנהל, זו הפעם השנייה כבר שאני מברכת, על ארגון הכנס. אתמול היה לי ערב של נחת, אנחנו עכשיו בעיצומו של מכרז, או אפילו בסופו של מכרז לגיוס חבר סגל או חברת סגל חדשים למחלקה למדעי המחשב. באוניברסיטה הפתוחה גיוס חברי הסגל נעשה באמצעות מכרז פתוח, היו פניות של אנשים יוצאים מן הכלל, ואתמול בערב עשינו רעיונות, וכל המרואיינים שהגיעו לשורט ליסט ציינו כמה שהמחלקה הזאת היא מחלקה אטרקטיבית מבחינת השותפים לעשייה האקדמית, כולם פחות או יותר יושבים כאן איתנו, ואכן היה רגע של גאווה. אבל מעבר לברכות הסטנדרטיות, מה שבחרתי לעשות היום זה להקריא לכם שיר שבעקבותיו שתי חידות. את השיר מצאתי במוסף, הער... במוסף הספרותי של הארץ ב-26 לפברואר, והסיבה שאני מדבר בעברית זה שאני לא צריכה לתרגם שירים לאנגלית, זה קשה. והשיר נקרא חשבון הזמן, כתב אותו אמיר בקר, והוא הולך כדלהלן. אני, בעקבות זה שהגעתי הנה וראיתי את המרצה הנכבד שיושב בשורה האחרונה עם התינוקת בת החודשיים, אז אני אקדיש לכם את השיר. אבא נולד בשנת 37 ואני נולדתי בשנת 64. כשהייתי בן 37, אבא היה בן 64. לא היה צריך לחשב ולא לחשוב את זה. זה מין קסם של חשבון הזמן. ואני נולדתי בשנת 64, וילדי שלי נולד בשנת 99. וכשילדי, ילדי יהיה בן שישים וארבע, אני אהיה בן תשעים ותשע. ולא אוכל לחשב ולא לחשוב את זה, אבל אוכל לבכות. כותב השיר הוא כאמור אמיר בקר, עשיתי מה שאנחנו עושים כולם ועשיתי גוגל קטן ב... לחפש מי הוא אותו אמיר בקר, והחידה הראשונה היא האם זה אותו אדם. מצאתי דוקטור אמיר בקר, תלפיון, שהקים חברה 
והאם זה אותו אמיר בקר שכתב את השיר הזה? אני לא יודעת את התשובה, אם מישהו יודע אני אשמח לקבל אימייל שיגיד כך או אחרת. ניסיתי דרך התמונות לראות אם רואים שזה אותו בן אדם, לא הצלחתי. אז כיוון שאתם אנשי מדעי המחשב, יש להניח שאתם יותר מיומנים ממני. אז זאת החידה הראשונה. החידה השנייה, וזה נחמד, מצאתי שוב בפורטל המתמטיקה של ויקיפדיה, חידה מספר 67, שכבר התייחסה לשיר הזה. והחידה הולכת כלהלן, בשירו חשבון הזמן, מציג אמיר בקר את המידע הבא. אבא נולד בשנת 37, אני נולדתי בשנת 64, וכשהייתי בן 37, אבא היה בן 64. והשאלה, האם זה מאפיין ספציפי של תאריכי לידה אלה, או שיש כאן כדברי המשורר קסם של חשבון הזמן. אין עוד תשובה באתר, אתם מוזמנים לפתור, ואחרי היום גם תדעו איך. תודה רבה ותהנו מהיום. בהצלחה. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the management of the Open University, Hagit and uh, the Vice President, uh, Judith, for uh, supporting such events and also encouraging such events in all disciplines, not only in computer science that happens to be an area which is close to their heart. Uh, I would like to thank my friends from the department, uh, Michael Landberg, Landberg, Menor Mendel, uh, Daniel Reichmann, uh, and Lynette Hrathon, because without them this day would not be possible. And uh, uh, special thanks are due to Daphne Greenborn that you saw outside that uh, orchestrated this entire uh, production. So that's it. Let's start. I would like to invite Manor, who is the chair of the first session. You see, um, people should speak to the microphone. Uh, yeah? Okay, I, I, was, I was telling you here, it's a, it's a wrong thing. Do not take example from me. You should stand <laughs> here, because uh, otherwise uh, it's pointless, this uh, videotaping of the day. Okay, so first of all, I would uh, like to thank the speaker, the organizers of this uh, workshop for inviting me to uh, give this talk here. I'm very glad to have this uh, opportunity to tell you about my research. And uh, as you shall see, I really need help. So maybe uh, someone here will be able to help me. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about policy iteration algorithms and I'll uh, explain in a minute what these uh, algorithms are. So in fact, uh, uh, the talk would actually be divided into uh, two, uh, two parts, which would actually be interleaved. One is uh, I'll be talking about a concrete setting in which uh, we would like to solve, uh, to find solution for certain uh, type of games. So in fact, we'll be considering uh, at least four type of games. And these games would either have two and a half players, two players, one and a half, or one player. Now, uh, the half player actually stands for randomization or for nature. So a two and a half player game means that we have two opponents which are playing, but uh, there are also there is chance involved. Okay. Uh, so th the main objective uh, of this talk or of this uh, research area is to to solve these games. And this is still a, an elusive uh, goal. And uh, one way of doing that is to abstract the, program, uh, the problem and consider a, a, a more general problem, uh, which is uh, called optimization on abstract cubes. I'll also describe the, what this means. And we'll actually go back and forth between the concrete setting and the abstract setting. And the, the unifying theme here would be the uh, policy iteration algorithms that can be stated in uh, both domains. So either in the abstract setting or in the concrete setting. Okay, so let's begin with the, the definition of the games. And probably the best uh, definition is in this case is by example. So this is a very, so this is a very simple, this is a very simple two and a half player game. Okay, so uh, we have uh, two players. One of them is the, uh, the red player, which is the maximization player. And we also have the, the green player, which is the minimization player. And we also have uh, nature or uh, randomization. These are these uh, uh, small 
uh, blue squares. Okay, now uh, what is the objective? So th the game starts somewhere, uh, and it actually goes on indefinitely, it goes on forever. Now, what are the goals of the two players? So uh, the, uh, the, the, the maximizers want to maximize the expected average reward per turn. Okay, and the minimizers, of course, wants to, to do the opposite. He wants to minimize the expected average reward per turn. And let, let's see this example. I hope this would make things uh, clearer. So the game starts uh, somewhere. There is some... Uh, a predetermined uh, initial vertex. Let's suppose that it's uh, this green vertex, and there's a token placed on that vertex. And now, since the token is now, since the token is now on a green vertex, uh, the green player is now uh, supposed to choose an edge along which the, the token would be moved. Okay, so in this case, uh, the green player chose this edge, the token moves here, and note that uh, this 20, this is the payoff of the action, and the payoff is actually what the green player pays the red player. Okay, and, and as you remember, the, the green player wants to minimize the reward. So why did he choose uh, 20? I mean, he could have chosen zero, but of course, had he chosen this edge, zero, then in the next move, red would play here, and then uh, red would get 100, which is uh, really a lot. So this seems to be the, uh, the right move for, uh, uh, for green. Okay, now, after, after uh, making this move, the token is in now in, uh, temporarily in a randomization uh, vertex. And now, in this case, they are uh, with the uh, probability one half, the token goes here, with probability one half, the token goes there. So suppose that in this case, the, the red player was, uh, was lucky, the token is now here. And now, uh, the, the red player has two options. He can either use this edge and get a reward of 100, an immediate reward, or he can use this edge and get a reward of 20. So in this case, it doesn't seem uh, difficult to uh, speculate that 100 is the, is the choice. Okay, now, note that we are now uh, in the same position we were earlier and the green is again supposed to make a decision. Now, uh, in principle, the green, can, uh, the green player can change his mind and say, okay, last time I went down, but maybe it wasn't such a good decision. But clearly, if the green knows what he is doing, it seems that he, he is not going to change his mind. If uh, going down was the right choice in the, uh, uh, earlier, it's also the right choice now. So this is what green is going to do now, and now, just to make things more interesting, the, uh, luck is now maybe on his side, and now uh, red has to make a choice, and suppose that uh, red chooses this edge, and so on. Okay, so uh, what you see here in uh, uh, these uh, uh, green edge and two red edges, in fact, they are uh, a strategy or a policy for each one of these players, and in fact, it's not just any policy, it's a what we call a positional policy, in the sense, uh, because it, it, does, it only depends on the current... Uh, uh, state on the current uh, vertex in which the game is, it doesn't depend on the history, and it's also deterministic, right? The, the, the players don't toss coins and decide uh, where to go. Now, but there's still randomization, but the randomization comes from, uh, from the one half player, from nature, not from the players itself. And now, note that uh, after the two players have fixed their strategy, then in fact, what we have here is simply a Markov chain. And we can compute the probability in which uh, each one of the, the, well, this is essentially the uh, percentage of time in which the, the game uh, uh, visits each vertex. So in this case, uh, it can, it's not difficult to see that these are the, the limiting probabilities. And from that, we get that this is the average, the expected average reward per turn. Uh, when the players use these strategies, so it's something like uh, 43. Okay, and in this case, it's also not uh, very difficult to see that these are indeed the optimal strategies of the two players. Okay, so of course, I actually gave this talk once, and, the very, and I said that one of the major open problems is whether 
uh, whether we can find optimal strategies for such games in polynomial time. And one very, really very bright student asked me, but there are only three vertices, so how, <laughs> how difficult can it be? <laughs> so of course, <laughs> I'm talking about uh, the general case in which we have uh, n vertices, and uh, from each vertex we may have uh, two or more actions, okay, and the probabilities are not necessarily, so from each vertex we may have a three-way split or an n-way split, I mean, it's not, uh, is restricted as uh, the, the very simple example there. Uh, okay, so one thing I should point out that there are no things. From every vertex, there's always at least one edge that uh, one can choose, and there's payoffs on the actions. And we want to, uh, this is the mathematical uh, formulation of what I said earlier. The players want to maximize or minimize the uh, the limit of the expected reward per turn. Now, uh, this is what seems to be a, a, a more intuitive for us, but mathematically there are some difficulties because if we don't restrict the way in which the players play, then in fact this limit might not, uh, might not exist. So to make this uh, definition uh, uh, rigorous, we should uh, put here lim soup. A another variant, uh, which, uh, which is also interesting, is called the discounted variant, which is very similar. So the only difference is that we assume that there is inflation or there is uh, some interest rate. So it's better to get high payoffs early because then we can put them in the bank and get interest. So in that case, we multiply the i-th reward by lambda to the i. Okay, and just to normalize, we multiply it by one minus lambda, but. Uh, other than that, it's, it's the same. Now, uh, we are, I'm mostly interested in this version. This seems to be uh, more intuitive, but there are certain uh, mathematical uh, uh, difficulties or technicalities with this definition. So uh, most of what I say, uh, strictly speaking, is, is true only for the discounted case, uh, but it can be made a, a, uh, valid for the, the limiting average case with some slight modifications which I don't want to get into. Okay, so, uh, okay, and as I've already said, one of the, uh, the basic theorems here, so I mean, it's very intuitive, but it definitely needs a proof, is that both players actually have optimal positional strategies. And the main problem is, uh, can we actually find such optimal strategies in polynomial time? This is a, a major open problem. Okay, uh, maybe I'll skip this uh, slide. I'll just show it very briefly. It just says that in each, each vertex in a game has a value. Okay, what this means is that uh, uh, the maximizers can, can uh, guarantee that the expected average reward per turn will be at least this value, no matter what the other player will do. And the minimizer has a strategy which guarantees that uh, the, the expected average reward would be no higher than that value, no matter what the other players do, uh, will do. And both these optimal strategies are positional, and the promise holds even if the other player is using a, a general strategy. I mean, it's history dependent, it's randomized, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, what I showed you uh, 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 in the previous slide was uh, a two and a half player game. So uh, you may think that actually the difficulty here comes from the, uh, from, the, from the probabilities, from the randomization, but actually even if we uh, remove the randomization and we now get a completely deterministic game, so now it's only a two player game, which we'll call the a mean payoff game, then, uh, so these are exactly the same definitions. So uh, the game now is easier in the sense that there are pseudo polynomial time algorithms, meaning that uh, uh, we can solve the game in polynomial time if the weights are given in unary, but there's still no known polynomial time when the, uh, in the standard version where the, the weights or the payoffs are, are given in binary. Okay, so there's still no polynomial time algorithm known. And in fact, we'll see in a minute, there is an even a special case of such deterministic game for which no polynomial time algorithm is known. 
Okay, but uh, we can also look at something, uh, uh, another very interesting restriction in which we go to, down to one and a half players. So this time we have one player which is uh, essentially uh, competing against nature. So you have only one vertex, only red vertices or maybe only, only uh, green vertices. Okay, and, and this time uh, uh, it's easy enough that we can actually solve it in polynomial time, but essentially the only way known of doing that is by solving an LP. So it's known to be uh, solvable in polynomial time, but it's not, not yet known whether it's strongly polynomial, and that's another uh, major open problem. Okay, and fi uh, okay, so these are the Markov decision processes, and uh, so we either remove the, the maximization vertices, or in this case we remove the minimization vertices, and we are left just with the maximization and uh, vertices and randomization vertices, and it's actually fairly simple. Actually, it's a nice result to show that you can formulate that as a linear programming uh, program, but uh, you can glance at it, but I won't uh, uh, dwell on it because I need my time for other things. Okay, so one thing that we can actually notice about these games, so these are the stochastic payoff games, this is the name I'll use in this talk, is that even though we don't know how to solve them in polynomial time, uh, they actually, so the decision problem uh, corresponding to this game actually belongs to NP intersection co-NP. Now, why is that? Because suppose that we want, uh, I want to prove, so I suppose that I'm the maximizer and I want to claim that the value of the game is at least new. So a very simple proof of that claim is simply, I'll give you a, a positional strategy. I'll give you my, op my optimal strategy. And then you can uh, verify that this strategy does indeed guarantee an expected average reward of new, because once I fix my strategy, now it's essentially a mark of decision process which we can solve using linear programming. Okay, so we can check that the value is at, is at least new, and uh, since everything here is symmetric, we can also do the same and check that the value is at most new. Okay, so the, the problem belongs to NP intersection coin P but it's not yet known to be in P, so this is a, a very rare status now, uh, only enjoyed by, I think, certain other problems in, uh, that are related to, to cryptography. But such a thing that comes from uh, you know, combinatorial optimization, I don't think there are many, so there are many variants of these games, but I don't know anything which sounds completely different than that. So I guess the, the a natural, uh, a hope or a conjecture is that actually this problem does belong to P, but we just don't know how to prove it yet. Okay, at the very low end of the spectrum, if we get rid of a, a one and a half players and we're just left with one player, we get what is known as the deterministic Markov decision processes. And so now we have only one player and the so here it's, uh, do you recognize this problem by the way? So this is exactly the problem of finding a minimum mean weight cycle in a graph. And for this problem there are uh, very efficient strongly polynomial time algorithms. So in the, in the limiting average case that's a, a classic result of CARP from 1978. And actually, it can also be done uh, within the same time, time bound, even when, the, when there is a discount factor. Okay, so finally, when we are just left with one player and the problem is much less interesting, then we, we have satisfactory solutions, but once we, we are still have one and a half or two and two and a half players, we're still not sure what, uh, what to do. Uh, I guess that's an interpretation of uh, deterministic Markov decision processes. So very quickly we have a, a truck driver and it can traverse a, a only one edge a day and it wants to find a route which maximizes the expected gain uh, per day. Not, not the expected, I mean the, the, there's no expectation here, it wants to maximize the, the average uh, gain per day. So this is exactly the problem of finding a cycle with the largest mean. Okay, and the, the discounted version is actually very simple, very similar. The only difference is that now the, the truck is uh, unreliable. 
And after traversing each edge, there is a certain probability that it breaks down. Okay, so if you think about it, you say that this is exactly the problem we were talking about. So even the one-player game is still interesting. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, just a summary of all the games we were talking about. We have the two-and-a-half-player games, two-player, one-and-a-half, and one-player one games, and each one of them was studied uh, intensively on its own. There are, there are many applications which I won't get uh, time to get into them in, uh, uh, in AI, in OR, and things like that. So it's really a very interesting problem. Okay. Just uh, one last family of games that I have to tell you about before uh, starting to tell you about policy iteration algorithms uh, are games which are called the uh, parity games. And they may look a bit strange at first sight to people that don't, uh, don't have a, a logic or a, a volume B background. So uh, it's again, it's an infinite duration game. Uh, there are two players, the red and green, but this time we call them the odd and the even players. Okay, now uh, there are no, uh, no payoffs on the edges, but on the other hand, each vertex has what we call a priority, which is a real number. And uh, uh, so the game again starts at a certain vertex and it goes on indefinitely when the token is in a red node, the red player chooses a, a, the, the next edge, and when it's in, in a green node, the green player chooses the next edge. And now, uh, the even player, the, the red player, wins uh, if and only if the largest priority seen infinitely often is even. And otherwise, the old player wins. Okay, so uh, in this case, actually, you can actually verify that that's an that's a winning strategy for even from all vertices. I mean, no matter what the what the the odd player would do, uh, the largest priority seen infinitely often would be even, and that means that even would win. So, uh, why why the hell does anyone be interested in such games? So uh, there are very good reasons. So that they are equivalent to. Uh, two very interesting uh, problems that come from the realm of logic and the uh, uh, automatic verification. So it's uh, 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 being able to solve such games is equivalent to deciding the non-emptiness of omega three automata and also for, the, uh, for uh, deciding uh, modal mu calculus model checking. So I'm pretty sure most people here are not, uh, not familiar with these concepts. I'm also not... Uh, don't know much about them, but they are a major, uh, of major interest to the automatic verification community. Now, it, the, the thing I should just point, want to point out here is that parity games, even though they may look uh, strange at first sight, they are a very special case of mean payoff games. So it's, uh, if you didn't completely understand the definition of parity games, it doesn't really matter. Just think of them uh, in the following way. So we again have payoffs on the edges, but now uh, all edges that uh, emanate from the same vertex have the same payoff, and all payoffs are actually powers of n. Okay, so that's a, a very special case. Uh, okay, so after this long intro introduction, we are finally able to move to policy iteration algorithms, which are algorithms that we'll try to use in order to solve these games. Okay, so I actually use the word policy and strategy interchangingly, so it's the same. So sometimes I'll say policy, sometimes I'll say uh, strategy. But, uh, okay, so uh, and what I'm going to say now holds for all these types of games, so the, we, we may assume that we have two and a half players, and if, if we really want it to be strictly correct, and you, may, you have to think about the discounted version, if it's the non-discounted version, then there are some slight modifications which are needed, but it's the same uh, general picture. Okay, and uh, also for simplicity, let's assume that the out degree of each vertex, of each green vertex, is two. Now, it's actually uh, not difficult to reduce every game to this form. But it's a subtle point that I'll mention earlier. But, but so it, it, at first, I want to, to 
uh, define policy iteration algorithms on what I call binary games, the games in which the out degree of each vertex is two. Now, uh, as I said, there are two and a half players, but I'm only looking at the vertices controlled by green. Okay, I don't care about the other vertices for the time being. And so what is the policy of the, of the green player? The policy is just a, a choice of one outgoing edge out of uh, each vertex, right? So since there are only two, two outgoing edges, it actually corresponds to choosing a, a vertex of, a, of an n-dimensional cube, right? So this policy is 0, 1, 1, and so on, 0. So there are two to the n possible policies where n is the number of uh, green vertices. Okay, and now uh, I'll denote, I'll use pi to denote a policy, and uh, vi of pi is the, the value of the game, uh, uh, the value of the game starting at i when, when min uses pi, and max uses the optimal counter strategy. Okay? So uh, note that the, the value may actually depend on the initial. Uh, on, on the initial vertex. In the simple, very simple example that I showed at the beginning, the, it wasn't the case. So it, it was, in a sense, an ergodic game. So it didn't really matter where the game starts, but in general, it may matter. So that's why I have this i. And uh, we also have the value vector, which is the value of the game uh, when mean plays pi and max plays the, the optimal counter strategy from each one of the possible starting vertices. OK. So that's the uh, policies and values. And now we come to the important ingredient of uh, policy iteration algorithms, which is uh, switches. So suppose that this is the current uh, policy. So we say that we switch it at position i if we just change the decision at vertex i. Okay, or more generally, we say that we switch it at, uh, at a set of, uh, of positions j if we switch pi at all vertices of j. OK. Now, this is just a reminder. Remember that the, the value, uh, that the v of pi is actually a vector. That's the value vector. Now, uh, the very nice properties of this game, so even though we don't know how to solve them in polynomial time, these are the very basic things that we can prove. And these are the things that we hope uh, will, he will help us uh, get a polynomial time algorithm. So the first claim, so all these claims are very intuitive. I hope you would agree, uh, but they definitely need proof, but I will not uh, supply a proof in this talk. I don't have time, but the proof is not very complicated. So the, 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 the first claim says that, suppose that we change the decision at vertex i, then this should either improve the, the value of all vertices or it should uh, make the all values worse. Or, okay, so that means that we have, a, a, note that v of pi is a vector, okay? So uh, when we have this inequality, that means that this uh, inequality holds uh, component-wise, okay? So when we switch the i vertex, either we get an improvement in all vertices or we get worse value, at least not better values for all vertices. And it's intuitively very clear. I, uh, okay, so now we can actually uh, concentrate on, on, on switches which seem to be uh, good, switches which are improving. Okay, so let's define the improving set of pi. These are all, all positions i such that uh, uh, switching pi in the i positions gives us a smaller value. And now remember that in, in this setting we are... No, so uh, as I said, in, in the if it's average reward, then this is not uh, completely right. But in the discounted case, that's uh, that's exactly right. And in the in the in the average reward, we actually have to look not only on the value, but on also on, a, on another component, which is called potential. And then we have essentially a lexicographical ordering of that. So you either improve the value. Uh, or the value stays the same and the potential uh, decreases. Okay. Okay, now, what I was uh, just telling you, to remember that we are looking now at this in, in, from the point of view of the, of the minimizer, so getting a smaller value is an improvement. Okay.
Okay, that's why uh, we say that i is an improving switch of uh, v of pi i is less than v of pi. Okay. Now that's the the, the main uh, or the, the the most important thing is that uh, actually we can actually get an optimal strategy just by local improvements. Meaning that if pi is not the optimal strategy, there is at least one switch which is improving. Okay, so that's claim two. And uh, the thing which makes things even more interesting is that is the following. So if we have two switches which uh, each one on, the, on, on its own is improving, then if we do both of them together, then it's still improving. So I'm not claiming that it's better than doing each one of them on its own, but it's still better than the original position. And this holds not only for two uh, uh, switches, but for any subset of switches. So if J is a non-empty set which is uh, contained in the improving switches, then uh, switching pi at all position of J is a, is a good idea, or at least a, a reasonable idea. Okay, so this uh, suggests uh, a very natural algorithm which was first formulated by uh, Howard in 1960, which is called the policy iteration. So start with some initial policy, and uh, uh, while the policy is not optimal, and remember that we can actually check whether a policy is optimal because uh, this, this uh, corresponds to a one and a half player game or one player game. So while it's not optimal, uh, so if it's not optimal, there are some improving switches, so do some of them. Now we get a better value. So the algorithm would never cycle because the values keep uh, decreasing, keep improving. Okay, and uh, uh, clear that there are many variants. The question is which switches to perform. And, uh, okay, one thing that I should point out here, even though I will not get into that, uh, I would not explain it in this talk. So. Uh, how do we know whether a switch is improving? Of course, we can, so we can evaluate the current uh, policy. Now we can also do the switch and re-evaluate the policy. Okay, and we, and we can do that for each switch uh, separately. So in principle, we can do that. And if we are only interested in polynomial time algorithm, then we might as well do that. But in fact, uh, it's actually much easier just to decide whether, whether uh, whether a switch is improving, whether a switch is improving, there is actually a linear time algorithm that checks uh, uh, for all switches at once uh, which one is improving, which one is not improving. Okay, so uh, this is one reason why this algorithm is so uh, so easy to implement, and as as I'll explain in a second, actually behaves quite well in practice. So it's very easy to find improving switches. And the algorithm performs very well in practice. So in practice, take almost any game that you like, run this policy iteration algorithm, and uh, yeah, before you know it, you get the optimal solution, and uh, also, of course, a proof that it's the optimal solution. And by the way, so also maybe the simplest way of showing that all these claims that, for example, that there are values and things like that actually go through the policy iteration algorithm. So in order to show that there is a, an optimal uh, positional strategy, we say, okay, let's run the policy iteration algorithm. This gives us an, a strategy. This is optimal, at least for the positional strategies. Then we argue that it's also optimal for all strategies. So that's, uh, okay. But what is still missing, uh, well, more than 50 years after this algorithm was formulated, is the, a good understanding of the complexity of this algorithm. Okay, so note that uh, uh, all I said right now, everything I said right now can actually be cast in the following abstract setting. So we have a, a function which is defined on the hypercube. Okay, and the function gives, so you can think about it as being real numbers, but in fact it's uh, tuples of real numbers, okay? Doesn't really matter. And our goal <coughs> is to, to find the minimum of this function, that's the, Remember that uh, every vertex of the cube is, uh, corresponds to a policy, okay? We want to find the optimal policy, so we want to minimize this function. Of course, if this is a general function, then uh, it's a very hard problem, but this function has very, uh, very nice properties. And the main property that we are using is the, is the, is the, uh, the following property, is that uh, if we look at every restriction of f, uh, by a restriction meaning that we fix 
some of the, some of the inputs here to some uh, predefined values. So uh, every restriction of f has a unique local minimum. And uh, we can actually state it uh, in this way, but uh, let's not do it. Uh, and also for simplicity, I'll assume that uh, the, uh, the function is, uh, is non-degenerate, in, in, in meaning that uh, every two uh, vertices here have strictly different values. Okay, so, that's, uh, so that we would not have to deal with uh, equalities. Okay, now this abstract setting was uh, studied by many different people, uh, including uh, Gil Kalai here. Uh, we call them abstract objective functions. Uh, and th the reason most people were interested uh, in them is that they are actually related to uh, the study of linear programs. Okay, which, uh, uh, okay, so that's the improving switches in the uh, in the abstract setting, it's exactly the same. Uh, we again have this, uh, so th th that's the assumption that there's no local minima. Uh, that's the lemma that we had before, that we can actually do several switches at once and it's always improving. Uh, okay, and, and so essentially the, the, uh, the algorithm that I uh, sketched before, the policy iteration algorithm actually uh, works in this abstract setting. Okay, so in fact, what we showed is that uh, the games define a function that satisfies these conditions. So what we'll do for the rest of the talk, we'll study policy iteration algorithms in uh, two settings. One is in the abstract setting, if we just assume that the function satisfies this condition. And then we'll see what happens when we move to the concrete problems where the, we know that these abstract uh, functions actually come from games. Okay, but before we do that, we have to uh, consider w uh, which policy iteration algorithms we are actually talking about, and there are many different variables, because uh, the, the question we have to answer is which switches uh, are we going to perform? Okay, so there are actually two categories of uh, algorithms. There's, there are algorithms which I'll describe first, which do only one switch at a time. So maybe the simplest algorithm you can think of is the do just one switch and do the switch with the smallest index. Or if you come from linear programming, maybe you, you say, okay, let's do the switch which gives us the, 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 the largest improvement. Or let's do a random uh, profitable switch. This is called random edge. Or there's a slightly more complicated randomized algorithm called random facet, which I'll mention in a minute. Now, not that all these uh, algorithms do only one switch at a time, but the, what might be important here is that we actually, uh, unlike linear programming where a pivot step just uh, takes one, uh, uh, one constraint that moves it uh, in and out of the basis, here we can actually do many switches at once. So uh, a very natural algorithm is to do all profitable switches or to do each profitable switch with probability one half or if we could somehow find the best combination of switches and do them. Okay, so we have many different algorithms. And as I said, this is reminiscent of the simplex algorithm of Danzig. In the simplex algorithm, we are taking a walk on some uh, general uh, polytope. In our case, we are taking a, a fairly similar walk, but on a, on, on a hypercube. And, uh, the, the nice thing here is that we can actually jump. We don't have to traverse single edges. We can actually go from one, so not that for, going from here to here, this is essentially doing three uh, switches at once. If they are all improving, we know that we'll actually land up in a, in a better place. Okay, now, as I said, there is a similarity with linear programming. Of course, with linear programming, most people think rules are known to be exponential, this is, uh, I mean, the first results, are, I guess, were obtained by Klee and Minty, 1972. Uh, still open where there is, there is some maybe randomized polynomial pivoting rule. And uh, one of the difficulties encountered here is that we don't even know that the diameter of each such polytope is uh, 
polynomial, even though the famous Hirsch conjecture says that it is, but know that in our case, we're essentially bypassing this issue because we know that the diameter here is at most n. So there is always, a, if we are clairvoyant, we can always find a sequence of n switch, a, a sequence of n, at most n switches that would get us to the optimal, uh, optimal uh, policy. We just not, don't know which uh, switches to do. So, okay, so this leads us to the, uh, the abstract setting that I like most, so we can even abstract away the, the values of the function. Note that the only thing that we care about is the orientation that we get on a cube. So, so initially, each, each uh, vertex here had a value, but now the only thing that we care about is whether going from this vertex to one of its neighbor, whether that's an improving uh, move or not. So this is what's called the, an acyclic unique sync orientation of the cube, so it satisfies two conditions. First, it's acyclic, and the second is that every face has a unique sink. This corresponds to the fact that, uh, uh, that, there are, that for every restriction, there is the, the local minimum is a global minimum. Okay, so let's uh, we'll skip that. So it was studied by many, many people here. Uh, okay, so uh, how long do I still have? 10 minutes? Okay, so uh, very quickly, there is an, a, a very nice algorithm by uh, Kalai, Matushek, Shadir, and Wenzel, uh, which was uh, uh, initially stated for linear programs, uh, which uh, probably won't have time to go into it, which, uh, which is known to run in uh, sub-exponential time. Okay, even in the abstract setting and even in a more a general abstract setting in which the, we are talking about uh, linear programs or, I mean, abstract, abstract, uh, not necessarily cubes, but abstract, <coughs> abstract uh, objective functions on general uh, polytopes. Okay, so what is known about uh, the complexity of these algorithms? So let's first of all look at uh, the complexity of uh, the algorithm which do one switch at a time. So uh, first edge is actually known to be very bad. This is, in fact, the Clementi. We can actually adapt this uh, algorithm to this case. Now, random edge is actually quite intriguing. So in the abstract setting, there is a sub-exponential lower bound, but there's no uh, no known, essentially, essentially no non-trivial uh, upper bound. Uh, random facet, on the other hand, is in this setting quite well understood, so the, the running time we know is uh, two to the theta of uh, uh, square root n. So note that that's already quite interesting because that means that uh, uh, this, so every algorithm here immediately translates to an algorithm for the games we were describing earlier. So that means that we have a sub-exponential algorithm for the games, okay? On the other hand, this lower bound says that uh, that in, okay, so maybe there is hope that uh, uh, this algorithm actually runs faster on games, okay? So we'll get to that in a second. Uh, these are the people responsible for these results. Uh, okay, many switches at once, uh, these are the known results. Uh, so unfortunately here, all bounds are, except this one which is still not known, all bounds are uh, exponential. Uh, okay, note that switch all, which is maybe one of the most natural algorithm, which says uh, do all profitable switches at once. So unfortunately, in the abstract setting, it's exponential. So it's not completely clear yet. Uh, so there is a, it's exponential, but there is still a quite a large gap here between uh, just barely sub a, a little o of 2 to the n and 2 to the n over 2. Now, actually, uh, I actually conjecture that, there, that, the, uh, that this, can, this upper bound can be improved to Fibonacci numbers, but I, want, I don't have time to explain why I make this uh, conjecture. But, uh, and, and this might be close to the, to the, to the right result, but uh, of course we don't know. Okay, so uh, where do we stand right now? So we started with a concrete problem. We went to the abstract setting. 
we had an algorithm that could also be uh, phrased in the abstract setting. And in the abstract setting, we saw that some of them are quite good. I mean, they are sub-exponential, but they are only sub-exponential. They are not polynomial. Okay. Now, on the other hand, so if we look at, uh, uh, we have actually a, a hierarchy of problems. So AUSOs, these are the, all the abstract problems, but uh, we have problems coming from two and a half player games and uh, from two player games and so on. So maybe, so uh, it seems that uh, uh, very reasonable to, to conjecture that not every AUSO can actually result from a game. Okay, let alone a more parity game or a two-player game. But in fact, uh, no such containment is actually known. So that's something that, uh, which apparently still leaves hope that uh, maybe, for example, the random facet, which was only sub-exponential in the abstract setting, maybe it's polynomial in the, in the concrete setting. But unfortunately, so in fact, I was very hopeful in that respect. And uh, I was pretty sure that the only thing which is missing is the proof. But uh, last year, uh, a German student called Friedman actually proved that uh, switch all, for example, is, uh, is exponential even in the concrete setting. OK, a very elaborate construction that shows that there are actually games uh, for which switch all actually takes exponential time. Uh, okay, so at that stage I thought, okay, uh, that's a serious blow, but uh, maybe for, a, for example, one and a half player games, maybe switch all is still uh, polynomial, and that would also be an amazing result because it would give a, a strongly polynomial time algorithm for Markov decision processes, but uh, this month, actually, another young student she from, uh, from Warwick, <laughs> uh, John Fernley, showed that switch all is actually exponential even on MDPs. Now, here there is actually a small uh, window of uh, maybe a small uh, opening for hope is that uh, this lower bound is not for binary MDPs. And uh, I don't have time to get into these uh, delicate definitions, but there's still hope that even though every MDP can be, re uh, can be reduced to a binary MDP, applying a policy iteration on the original MDP and the reduced MDP is not the same algorithm. So maybe there's hope that this is still uh, exponential. And, okay, so I guess, uh, I mean, if, you're not, if you cannot beat them, join them. So. Uh, at that stage, I realized that maybe I should be <laughs> aiming at getting negative results. And uh, very recently, together with Friedman and uh, uh, Thomas Hansen, which is sitting somewhere here, we actually managed, managed to prove that a random facet on parity games is also not better than, what, than the general promise that we get in the abstract setting. So these are uh, three... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, unhappy events, but maybe there's still hope that there is some polynomial variant here, and there are many other algorithms for which we don't have lower bounds in the concrete setting. For example, there's a random edge, there is, uh, and, and many others. Uh, okay, that's uh, I, uh, that's a. Uh, So uh, that would, of course, be a very major result. I and mean, right now, we don't know how to do that. And we don't even know how to. So here, we, we haven't given hope yet. But it also seems very hard to, uh, to, get it, uh, to get such a result for the binary case. And well, maybe I'll, I'll actually do uh, mention this slide. So the difference. So there is a, a sort of a, a cheat here. So when the things are binary, then policy iteration is very well defined. Because you, the, well, if you, either, you, if you switch, you either improve or you don't improve. And if you, if you want to switch that position, then uh, there's no way. Uh, uh, you clearly need to do a certain switch. Now, uh, in the non-binary case, there, for, for, a simple, for a single vertex, there may be several improving switches. And the question is which one you would like to do. 
And policy iteration, remember that I told you that there is a very cheap way of deciding which moves are improving and which ones are not, but they don't tell you exactly by how much the, this move is improving. And most algorithms just use this rule to decide what seems to be the best improvement. So in all these results for the binary case, there is still this element uh, embedded inside. That's why I think that the binary case is different, but uh, we can talk about it uh, later. That's uh, uh, an example of these games. Now, uh, on, the, on the bright side, uh, so the, there is still hope that in the, for the one-player games, for the ter deterministic Markov decision processes, uh, we might still get a polynomial uh, upper bound. And the best upper bound uh, currently known are the following, that, uh, obtained by uh, Thomas and myself. And none of, so we don't have any, up, any lower bound in which the number of iterations is more than the number of edges in the graph. And these are the best uh, lower bounds. Again, I don't have to, time to explain how this works. This is uh, animations by Thomas. And uh, so I actually, uh, I'll be bold and conjecture that uh, in the one player case, or at least their policy iteration is polynomial. But I've been wrong before, so I don't know how, uh, <laughs> how much weight should it, you should attach to that. And, okay, so I, I think I mentioned uh, many open problems during my talk. Uh, maybe the most intriguing open problem is whether there is some way of uh, co coercing policy iteration to run in polynomial time in any, in any setting. And of course, uh, any other algorithms for uh, that I mentioned, even if they are not uh, of the policy iteration variety would also be welcome. And uh, I'll end here.